Evening everyone, I hope you're well. It's the Touch Tennis Show, it's 8 o'clock. I'm very excited to announce that this is the first time ever we have got a guest on the show. And it's none other than Ashley Neves, who runs the Instagram account, The Tennis Mentor. Uh, if you're not already following him, you get a chance now to screenshot and bring in um, the underscore tennis underscore mentor. I'll also put that up on the screen in a few minutes so that you'll be able to see that too. Uh, now, Ash Neves has been playing touch tennis for quite some time. Humble photography, thank you very much. It's not just nice lighting, is it? I mean, let's be honest, this is outrageously good lighting. I mean, this is the best lighting even you've ever seen. It's it's just another level. I mean, I want to be humble about it, but I'm just too great. I mean, why should I be? It's hard to be humble when you're A, as pretty as this, and B, as talented as this. Uh, but yeah, I'm just using some cheap lights, the new air light up there, and I've got another new air light as a hair light, or a rim light, <laughs> a rim light, <laughs> behind me here. Um, and that just makes it up. And then, of course, behind me, we've got the obligatory light that says stay humble. But I'm using an f1.1 lens, which I've mentioned to you before which gives you that beautiful uh, shallow depth of field. So with no further ado, um, I'm going to bring in our guest, Mr. Ashley Neves. I want you to give him a round of applause with lots of likes at the bottom there. Um, have I played Robbo? Yeah, I crushed him. He's a bunny. Uh, let me just bring in Mr. Ashley Neves. <laughs> Good evening, sir. Lovely. How are you? Great, mate. Thank you so much for having me. It's been one of my things on my bucket list and um, yeah, finally here. Yeah, I mean, can imagine being this young in life and one of your life goals just being done. You, you don't have to do any more. You just, that's it. Incredible, incredible. But no, love the show. I've been watching it, you know, ever since you started it. And, um, you know, it's gone up a notch with the lighting and, and um, you know, everything you've done with it. So great work, mate. I'll have a drink to you. Well, it's sparkling water, but... Me too. And a drink to myself as well for putting on such an amazing show and having guests like Ashley Neves. Now, this is a man who has played touch tennis for many, many years. Um, we're going to go into asking him a few questions about you know, his uh, tennis history as well, not just his touch tennis history, um, because he coaches tennis full time. And he won the LTA Coach of the Year Award in 2019. It's no meat feat. There are at least 5,000 coaches in this country. And I've got to say, 4,000 of them are absolute junk. Um, 900 of them are quite competent. Um, you know, adequate. 50 of them are unbelievable. And to win, you've got to be nominated by Ash? Yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, so got nominated. I won um, the Hampshire Award and then you get put forward to a regional one and then managed to win that. And, and yeah, got put through to the last three, had a nice day out of Wimbledon. And um, yeah, most incredible day of my tennis career, my tennis coaching career anyway. Um, but yeah, very lucky, honoured honor to have won it and, um, you know, lucky with all the people that I've worked with and, you know, it's, it's, um, it just, it really helped to boost the club and, and, and that sort of thing. So yeah, very lucky. Oh, I don't know about luck. I think there's, um, there's a fair few things you can talk about in life that involve luck, but there are some things that involve a great deal of perseverance, commitment and hard work. And I know that you take your work seriously, but more importantly, what I've noticed about you over the last year is unlike almost any other coach and i'm talking about people with tens of thousands of followers as well your video game has gone up another notch this year you have increased your production values um and i know you've been you know watching great tech talks and stuff buying the right equipment but not necessarily splurging but just buying appropriate equipment for what you do tell us a little bit about when that journey began for you yeah so lockdown number one um back in april i was trying to figure out a way that i could keep my players that I work with active while I was unable to get on court with them. Um, so it started off, I've always been quite active on, on social media, Instagram, and, you know, post lots of pictures and things, but, but never really delved into the video side of things. So yeah, during lockdown, I posted a few different challenges, you know, they'd be 30 second clips and just use my iPhone and, and kind of really enjoyed it and started looking at different um, ways to edit the, the films and, and gradually over time it kind of improved you know through the quality through just understanding a little bit more about the, the videography side of things and um, when I got back to the club after the first lockdown I, I had lots of the members of the club kind of commenting about the videos that they'd seen and almost quoting some of the lines that they'd heard and I kind of thought actually they've, they've enjoyed it they found it valuable so I thought I'd kind of take it to the next level, make the videos a bit longer, um, started a YouTube channel. And yeah, since then it's, it's grown. I've, I've posted quite a lot. I think I've done about 80 videos now on YouTube and feedback's been 
lovely. Uh, you know, it's been really nice to help everybody. And um, yeah, hopefully you'll see a you know, slow improvement with the quality. Taking loads of tips from you, Rash, you know, with lighting and things. And, you know, if you look back at my first YouTube video, you'll notice that, you know, this room was really badly lit and, and it didn't look very professional. And hopefully now, you know, I'm using my iPhone here, but, um, you know, taking tips from you with regards to how to set things up has really helped. So, yeah, hopefully I'm, I'm putting a bit of value out there. You know, there's loads of really good people out on, on Instagram and on YouTube and taking lots of tips from them and, and putting a bit more out myself. It's been um, it's been an absolute pleasure to watch your. Uh, oh, let me just flick that back on there. I almost lost you for a second. Um, yeah, it's been a pleasure to watch that growth. Actually, just seeing your channel, not only the number of subscribers grow, but also the the interaction with your videos on Instagram has been awesome. I've seen how many people watch your videos. It's incredible. Like you get a really high engagement rate, a really good loyalty. So people are tuning in, and also the free content that you put out at the beginning of the year. Little things like, oh, you know, can you bounce a ball on the edge of the racket, bouncing between your legs. Not necessarily trick shots, but great shots that you can practice that will keep your hand-eye coordination in check while we're all in lockdown. Um, a lot of those were really well received. So yeah, hats off to you for those those videos. So tell me a little bit about your your, your tennis playing. Um, before you got into coaching, I mean, you started playing at what, five, six years old? I was actually a little bit older. I was about seven or eight years old. And um, my parents just saw an advert in the local paper. Um, it was a summer camp, went along to this summer camp um, in Portsmouth, at my local tennis centre, and absolutely loved it. And I'm, I'm the first of five boys. I've got four younger brothers, and, and they all got into tennis, you know, at various levels and, and degrees. But um, yeah, so I got started did this summer camp and never looked back. I played once a week from then. By the time I was 10, 11, I started, you know, taking it a little bit more seriously, started competing, playing maybe two, three times a week. Um, and by the time I was 15, I kind of knew that tennis was my thing and, and that it was going to be um, hopefully my career longer term, whether it be being a player or, or being a coach. I kind of knew that tennis was where, where I wanted to be. And um, yeah, I left school at 16 played tennis full time for a couple of years. And during that time, I kind of played, you know, a decent level um, domestically, played in the British tour events, played a few um, junior ITF events, went abroad to a couple of different places and got smashed up by a few um, decent players. But it was a good experience. And um, yeah, I kind of needed to find a way to pay for it. So, you know, the travel, it, it was expensive, booking accommodation and not knowing, you know, when you travel up to Bolton for a British tour, you know, how many days do you need to book for accommodation? You know, if you can get knocked out first round, you're back down on the same day. If, if you, you manage to get through a few rounds, it's going to cost you a lot of money. And actually, you're not going to earn enough money to cover your, your expenses. So, um, it's, it, you know, at that level, it's very, very, very tough. And um, so started coaching to fund it. And gradually over those few years between 16 and, and 19, really, um, my coaching kind of started to overtake my playing and I kind of had to make a decision at that point um, as to what to do, whether to continue competing or whether to, to coach. And I, and I made the decision to, to take my coaching a bit more seriously, which looking back at it now is probably the best decision I made because I've had, you know, years and years to practice the, the craft of coaching. And um, yeah, so tough decision at the time, but the right decision. And what, you talk about some of the, the the financial side of things, and I mean, I'm I, I don't you don't mind me saying this on on, on live. It's not like you, you know you're from a, a some multi billionaire family, so it's funding that route. What are we talking about in terms of if you're not winning these futures and ITFs, and you're 18, 19 years old, and you're playing them? What sort of money are you having to spend on, say, a monthly basis to play professional tennis? hundreds you know near near to the to the thousand you know one thousands you know a bit that sort of price and, and actually i wasn't at the stage where i was winning these british tours so i wasn't making that money back at all right um you know so i was lucky enough to have really supportive parents but they didn't have a lot of money and yeah. um so you know they couldn't afford to to keep me so i had to pay my way around at that age you know they supported yeah. me as a youngster but when i was 16 17 it was it was my job to, to fund it so coaching was the only way and yeah. um so, yeah, no, it's it's tough. And you, unless you've got really, you know, supportive parents financially that can, that can look after your tennis or if you get a sponsor, it's a very, very um, tough profession. Very, very tough. And, and, you know, there's lots of players out there that, you know, are fantastic, incredible tennis players, you know, top 
500 in the world that are really struggling around the tour. And um, yeah, I, in my opinion, tennis is, you know, along with touch tennis, is the best sport for your, um, you know, you're developing life skills. You know, I, I t- tell every parent to get their kids into the sport, but it's, it's to make it professionally is incredibly tough. So we've got a question here from Tennis Box TV. He's 13 years old. I've seen him playing touch tennis. He can clearly hit a ball. Um, and he's asked, you know, have you any tips as, you know, how to reach the top as a junior tennis player? You've got to work your socks off. Every single second that you're on that tennis court, you've got to work with purpose. And I think, you know, if, if you go on that court and and you put 100% effort in and have a purpose behind what you're doing, then you're going to give yourself the best chance. You know, I see too many people going on court and just having a knock up and not really thinking about what they're doing and not really pushing themselves. Um, surround yourself with the right people, you know, whether it be the right coaches, the right players that you're playing with. Um, positivity is important. And um, don't focus on the results right now. Focus on, on the process. You know, you, it doesn't matter if you're losing matches right now, as long as you're developing yourself and your game. So the, um, I, I agree with a lot of that and the effort, and, but I, I would ask that someone like Tennis Box TV, you know, George, you, you ask yourself also, why is it you want to be the best junior in the world? Why is it you want to be the, so for example, I'm quite content in life with being the best I can be on the guitar. I'm never going to be Eddie Van Halen or Steve Vai or somebody like that. I'm just content with being the best I can be. And I think it's because tennis is a sport that has rankings, ratings, competitions, tournaments, it's such a different pressure that you the only way you can ever be gauged as worthy. And if you attach your self esteem to those things, you're looking to a lifetime of disappointment. Instead of being the best junior out there, I would recommend you think about being the best you can be all of your life. And I think Rafa has that mentality. Certainly, he he seems to exude that mentality. He just wants to be the best he can be. Being number one is a bonus. But he didn't seem to have any problem with being number two in the world to Fed for five or six years, as long as he was winning majors, as long as he was playing his best tennis. Yeah, I mean, that, that number one ranking is just a byproduct of the hard work. You know, yeah. and it is the process that gets you there. It's not chasing rankings because, you know, like you say, it's a slippery slope once you start focusing on that. You know, you can, you can only go one way. It can only, you can only feel negative about that if you're not there. So, um, yeah, process is the key. So Chris Sutar has joined in. He's one of the few coaches, again, that I said who's at the upper echelons of the game. I might have been slightly harsh at the beginning when I... <laughs> said some people are uh, not necessarily particularly good. Uh, Selena Chris is a legend in as of well. the sport. He Chris is, is a yeah. legend of the sport. And he's one of the, the, the coaches that I look up to. Um, you know, the stuff that he puts out there is quality. And, um, you know, I'd love to get on court with him sometime when um, when the time's right. You must be about five foot two if you're having to look up to Chris Sutar. <laughs> <laughs> or maybe you just get underneath that head so you don't get the shine hitting off it and blinding you. Um, but there are polarized glasses for that. Um, uh, Selena, thank you for joining. Uh, Chris Sutar is blushing. Oh, Jesus Christ. We really will need sunglasses now. It's going to be <laughs> God, from every angle. <laughs> he didn't think he was going to come on air and get abused. Chris was going to get on the show as well sometime because I value his opinion above almost anyone in the world of tennis. Um, and also I value his opinions as a human being. So, you know, I actually like the guy. Val- you know, genuinely, there are very few people that I would invite into my home, for example, anymore. And he's one of the people that I have invited to my home a couple of times and would regularly again. Great guy. Um, Mo, good evening. Mo Ali joining us. I hope you're well. Mo Ali, actually, it should be pronounced, not Ali. I'm pronouncing it like like I've given up and sold my soul and forgotten my roots. It's Ali. It's actually, I don't know why they say it. Write it A-L-I. It's U-L-I almost, but that would be Uli. We'll get into the um, semantics of spelling one other day. What about how to become the best when people you train with aren't your standard? Ash, give someone yeah. a tip here. Really important because I've had I've got some ideas on this, but it, really the reason I want you here is to answer questions like this. You know, you're playing against substandard players and you're trying to improve. Um, and, and I had this problem as the goat. You know, there was no one <laughs> my level for me to play against and raise my own levels. So what I would do is I would. Jokes aside, when I was playing tennis, there was a time when when touch tennis began and I would play against players that absolutely sucked at tennis, which is hard to believe when you see how bad I am. 
So what I would do is I'd say, right, I'm going to hit every backhand up the line. That's it. Every time they go to my backhand, I'm just going to try and nail it up the line. Every forehand, I'm going to go up the line, inside in or up the line from there. I'm not going to hit anything cross court. So that would be my practice session. Uh, I would exclude cross court. And then the next time I played them, I would exclude the lines. And I was like, I'm only allowed to rally cross court against them. That was what I would do. But what can you give us some decent tips for playing against bunnies and improving your game at the same time? Absolutely. So totally agree with you, Rash. I think, you know, having having ideas like that is, is a really good way to do it. If you think of Novak Djokovic or Serena Williams, they don't have many people better than them. They don't have anybody better than them to train. So quite often they'll have to train with two players. Um, you know, two on one drills are a really good way of, of kind of pushing yourself and challenging yourself. Um, have a, a goal in mind, like Rash said, you know, if, if it is to bully the backhand and, and hit one part of the court more often, then make it be that. It might be that you're trying to work on something technically. It might be your slice backhand. So force yourself into hitting more slice backhands. Um, but yeah, there's different ways you can do it. Think of it like when you play somebody better than you or a similar level, reading their game can be quite simple. They play good tennis, so they almost play predictable tennis. But when you're playing people that are a, of a lesser standard of you, it's not always as predictable. So you're, it's a bit of a challenge in a way to deal with those, you know, rubbish balls that come in short when you're not expecting it, or those those balls that hit the frame and, and are tougher to read. So treat it as a challenge. And um, like Rash said, have a focus in mind and try to just pinpoint that area of your game. And sorry, before I forget, I'm just doing something underneath your screen that was meant to be done seamlessly. And I've now done it. So you can now see at the bottom of your profile when you're on screen here. Yeah, exactly. It's there. So people nice. now tag you. That's, that's almost, that's bordering on, bordering on heroic. Yeah, and it's still there. That's awesome, isn't it? It's got the tennis mentor at the bottom. Absolutely love this. This is huge, new level. So the next guest we have on here, I'll prepare better for. Um, and the reason I didn't bother is because Ashley Neves once was the recipient of a golden set. <laughs> that had to be mentioned, right? Uh, of course. <laughs> I, I'm not. I'm not even going to make excuses, right? It was. It was three o'clock in the morning. I was. I was half asleep. Um, Alex Ball, if you're watching, if you're watching in the future, well played, mate. Um, the worst thing, though, it, it wasn't just the fact that. Yeah, uh, the second set was better, by the way. I did a lot better in the second set. But um, Jamie Lang, I don't know if you know Jamie Lang. He was watching, wasn't he? One of the yeah, celebs there. Made in Chelsea charity star. event. And it was, yeah, three o'clock in the morning at the NTC. And I got golden bageled. Hope that's the last of it, Rash. I hope nobody else hears of it. No, uh, I don't think I'll ever bring it up again. That's the one thing you can guarantee about me is that discretion is my middle name. You know, I'm... I'm So I lost you there for a second. You still there, Ash? I'm still here. Oh, sorry. I thought you just muted yourself and you were done for the day after <laughs> that golden set being brought up. But no, I promise not to bring it up again. Mr. Mark Butler, hello. Good evening to you. Hope you're well. Uh, thanks for joining in this live stream. Tonight's live stream, we have Ashley Neves with us, the tennis mentor, who is a an award-winning coach. He won Coach of the Year in 2019 in Great Britain and is yeah an all-round lovely guy who plays loads of touch tennis. I um, think we were all tired that night. Yeah, stay humble. Absolutely. Um, but yeah, that was, uh, that was a hell of an evening, wasn't it? So, all right. So moving on into the, the coaching world, we were talking a little earlier, you know, and I, I interrupted and talked about where you drew the line when it came to finances. And you're talking about between 6,000 and 12,000 pounds a year just to be a player, but that doesn't include paying your rent where you're living. That doesn't include eating when you're not on tour. It, it's like, so it's still a 20, 25 grand a year lifestyle and you've got zero income. I can't see how that's easy. So it seems like the decision you made to move into in, into coaching well, pay, panned out well. I mean, it turns out that it's not like you were untalented as a tennis player, but certainly it seems like your talents do seem to lie more, more in your tennis coaching, would you say? I think so. Yeah, I think. And, and because I started early, it allowed me to, to really develop um, that side. You know, I, growing up with four younger brothers, I think, helped with, um, you know, patience and, and dealing with kids. And, and I, I really enjoy that side of coaching, you know, working with the younger kiddies and, and giving them the, the foundations that they need to, to kind of take a lifelong love of the sport. And, you know, whether they make it as players or whether they, 
you know, play tennis at university or whatever they choose to do. I think tennis is a fantastic sport and, and really good for, for all life skills, you know, dealing with um, failure, dealing with winning and being humble, as, as you um, quite often say. Um, so, yeah, you know, and, and all sports are, are like it. But I think when you're in that arena in a one to one sport, it really kind of, um, it, you know, puts that that pressure that you know dealing on your own with failure all those sorts of things it's much tougher in a one-to-one sport and i think in in itself it it gives you a lot of good life qualities that you need i've got another one here from uh the tennis box um he was saying what's better touch tennis or touch tennis i think he's answered (laughs) his own question hasn't he yeah i think touch tennis is better yeah i think so yeah absolutely um also we have lots of bad weather and only outdoor courts which causes sessions to be cancelled what should I do? Two squads a week isn't enough. Never mind if they get cancelled. So, S and C, improve your fitness. You know whether it's your strength, whether it's your agility. There's loads of good home workouts out there that you can do. And um, being a good tennis player these days is way more than having good technique. Is is way more than hitting tennis balls. It's such a physical sport now. When you see those players on the tour, they are machines. And and I think you know if you can create yourself into an athlete actually that's going to be even more beneficial than the you know the, the technical side of things you know I, I i think it's a lot easier to um create a tennis player from an athlete in the, in the start rather than starting from mm. technique so yeah build up your your um your physical side of your game when you're not able to get on court but it, even if you are able to get on court it's good to do that too now here's a question for you you're building up your strength and conditioning when you've got somebody who's 12 13 years old i i don't recommend they ever do weights of any description um what sort of s and c are you talking about here i'm assuming it's more like band work speed work that sort of stuff you're not talking about getting in the gym and lifting you know for the people that aren't tennis players who are watching um we're not talking about you know benching their body weight and stuff. What are we talking about here in terms of S and C no, specifically? What I, would you so typical day for you with a with a junior, a thirteen year old? Yeah, so I'm, I'm you can do weight training, but body weight training, you know, you would never lift weights as a, as a younger junior player. Anything with explosive movements is really good as a tennis player because you know, as you know, you've got to move very quickly around the court. You've got to be very explosive when you're hitting shots. So yeah, endurance, stamina, obviously important, but actually. Nowadays, the points aren't as long, um, you know, the, the game is, is evolving in lots of different ways. And, and the players out there now are, are focusing mainly around their serve and ball number three or their return and ball number four. So so actually being able to, to have that explosive strength is important. So, um, yeah, there are lots of good programs out there for juniors to, to develop their um, tennis specific physical skills. Um, but outside of the tennis specific stuff, actually just improve your general fitness. Yeah. So, you know. Um, plyometric work is, is great for tennis players, you know, jump lunges and, and squat jumps and those sorts of things are really, really good. Yeah. See, I, um, um, Lucarias, Lucarias Perez, evening to you. Thanks for the applause. Um, I did find that the more heavy weight I did, uh, the stronger I was at the full extent of my range. So if I was using free weights a lot, I found that, do you remember when I cuffed Maka with those 35 kilogram dumbbells? <laughs> <laughs> Literally cold, just picked up two 35s, bang. In dead but, jeans. Yeah, and, and then he gets there and he can't even lift them. I think that ended him. I, I wish I'd played him at touch tennis straight after that because he would never have been able to beat me, no matter how good he was. Um, that's Maka, for those who don't know, is his younger brother who's called the forehand. It's possibly one of the biggest ground strokers that's ever played the game. He can hit off both wings so phenomenally hard. And just sorry, quickly before I finish, I'll, I'll go back to Mac in a second. I found that at my full extent of my range, I was able to control the ball better because I guess using heavy weights, you know, you've got strengthening your tendons. But what I lost was speed on court. I just didn't have that explosive strength, speed. Like, so no matter how strong I was, I couldn't get to the ball. And as soon as I started doing light weights, lots of repetitions and quick stuff i was able to get to the ball so much quicker that i didn't need to be at the extent of my range to hit a forehand because i was there early enough to hit it out in front of me yeah it's, it's functional strength isn't it you know it's the strength that you need to hit a forehand it's the strength that you need to hit a serve and actually you know 
bench press, deadlift, all good things for full body strength. But actually, tennis specific wise, you want to be doing those movements. So, um, yeah, anything dynamic, anything with acceleration um, and deceleration as well. Super important. And going back to Maka, he, your uh, first younger brother, he's the one directly below you, right? No, he's he's the third, actually. There's one oh, is between he? us. Yeah, oh, I didn't yeah. realize. So he um, he bludgeoned the ball on both sides with such obscene ferocity every single time. I mean, I have seen meteorites hit the surface of the moon with less aggression than he hit forehands. And I couldn't understand how... I remember he went three sets with Simon Roberts in uh, Oadby Tennis Club on AstroTurf courts in 2017, I'm going to say. And... Sorry, 16, actually. 2016. And he went three sets and he was in a position to win almost. And just about, as usual, Simon found the way. But he hit the ball for three sets so biblically hard. How does someone do that? How does someone gener- develop that sort of game where they can hit the ball that hard and it goes in? What is it that separates, say, him from you? You've trained in similar places. You've hit the ball very similar. What is it you think that he has? Is there some innate gift or is it something he just worked on because he was mentally so challenged? He knew he couldn't last more than six shots in a rally without losing concentration. Which one do you think it was? Yeah, it's a really good question. I honestly you can't think win this more... one. You're going to abuse your brother whichever way, but carry on. Yeah, yeah, but he's he's used to that. Um, I, I I honestly think it's more the mental side and and the way that he he likes to play his game style. So he's developed that game. It, it's crazy though. As a junior player, so he was an unbelievable talent on the tennis court. Unbelievable. So mm. um, he he played nationals. He played road to Wimbledon. Got to got to the last eight in the country. Like really, really good okay. player. But he was known as the wall. He would not miss a ball. He was Are you a filthy grinder. I'm no so way. Serious filthy grinder. But no, he was I about... cannot imagine Maka grinding a point in a million years. I mean, I just cannot imagine that. So he he um. Yeah, he, he, he won't mind me saying he played um, Carl Edmund two or right. three times as a, as a junior. And um, Carl at the time was a, a kind of later bloomer than, than Maka. Maka had been playing for years. He played since he was like two, three years old. And right. he used to beat Carl and he was just a brick wall. And I don't know, you have to ask him, I don't know what whether there was a moment that he changed or whether it was something that happened. But yeah, he, he absolutely, well, there you go, that one shot Maka. He absolutely spanks his forehands now. And I do think it was a mental switch for him because he is, um, what's a nice way of putting it? He He's a loose wire on the court. He, right. you know, he. I'm very calm as a tennis player. So I don't, you know, throw rackets. I don't shout. I'm quite cool and calm and collected. He's the opposite. Um, right. And so I think it reflects in our game style. So, yeah, I'm, I'm quite a steady Eddie, quite... Um, a solid player and I think that kind of matches up with the way that I my mind set on the court whereas he is a loose goose and he absolutely spanks it and it, you know if he's having a good day nobody can stop him but on the other side if he's having a bad day the, the racket will be over three courts away <laughs> I'm just trying to find a, a couple of rallies as, as we speak um, because you know we've got a lot of um, I mean that photograph was a classic example as you say one shot Neves you know it was we did. He, he he's actually here. He's 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 watching. Yeah, Emin Tennis today, is but... there. He's watching. Um, he's probably thinking, you know, why? Why have I come on here to get abused? And it's like, well, if you're on the Touch Tennis Show watching, you're kind of asking for it. You know, it's it's one of those things. So let's look at our photographs. We don't want. We want to go to videos, don't we? So Touch Tennis longer form videos. Hass versus Searl. Top five rallies. Maka, I mean... while you're there, did, is there a moment that that changed you? Because it it is like chalk and cheese you honestly two different people yeah let's have a look i mean this first rally is a really good example of um what my mouse has gone to sleep trackpad connected there you go right let's bring this in and you can comment on this while it's playing I mean, how good do you think Neves can be? Because he's still only 21 years of age, clearly got huge weaponry. Do you think he can be a number one in the game? I mean, at that point, we were thinking he could possibly 
he could possibly be number one in the game. The way he was hitting the ball in 2016. And he went two love up against Roberts in that fine in the quarterfinals of the Masters Cup 2016. Didn't win another game. It's crazy. It's crazy. And it's if if you had that game style with a slightly calmer um mindset on the court, yeah. um, that could kind of figure things out when things don't go your way, yeah, that would make the difference. And I think you know, it's it's in the heat of the moment. He's he's spanking that forehand all over the court, yeah. and if something doesn't go his way, he's raging about that, and and you know doesn't really think too much about how he can make adjustments. So, um, and he'll agree with me. His um, his game and his personality reflect one another. Yeah. Um, and on the flip side, it's similar to me. You know, I'm quite steady and I'm quite calm on the court. If if something was different, then you know I, I could be a better player as well. But it's funny it, in um, on the tennis court. He, he hits his forehand that big, but in his backhand, he doesn't. Um, whereas on touch de- when he plays touch tennis, he's actually a lot more confident with his backhand and he'll rip it as well. Um, yeah, I think I think touch tennis can do a lot for your tennis game. I know um, players at the club where I am at the moment, you know, some of them played um, touch tennis on the tour and, you know, started really getting into it and it really helped their game. And I'm talking about, you know, adults of 40, 50 years old and, and you know, they, they weren't, that strong at hitting, you know, top spin on the tennis court, but or sixty from... if you're talking about Gilead. <laughs> well, I've been polite. Um, yeah, but I mean... but yeah, it's um, just the hands that you develop and, and your reaction skills and being able to read what the ball's going to do before it's struck, because quite often, you know, when when you play when you play tennis, you've got a lot of time and you get a, you get away with being a bit lazy because you can wait to see what the ball's doing in the air before you start moving. But actually, when the pros play tennis, they need that information before the ball struck at the other end. You know, they need to see, they need to look at the opponent's body position. They need to look at the size of their take back to start gathering information as to what they're going to send back. Whereas in touch tennis, you have to do that because you don't have enough time just to watch the ball. So, um, you know, it's not just the technical thing that it can help with on the tennis court, but actually your your reading skills and, and learning to anticipate. Yeah, I think the, the one thing I learned when I was still playing both tennis and touch tennis was after I played touch tennis for a day and I went out and played tennis, the pressure to serve was gone because now I had two. You just go after both serves. I felt so confident. It was like, well, I'm not going to miss two. I'll miss one, sure, but I'm not going to miss two. And the other thing I felt was the court was just huge. So I couldn't miss. I was so used to ripping the ball and getting it up and down in this really compact space where the net is so high relative to the court suddenly you're at the baseline and the net's you know what is it it's uh 20 40 feet away from you almost and all you need to do is just pop it like that and it will always clear the net it's it's funny yeah, it's especially tennis. with your with your game style you know not be going above 20 30 miles per hour it's quite hard to miss it long as well so you can get it quite set. high in it. sorry are you the only player that's <laughs> ever been golden setted in history yes okay so anyway, moving on. So I feel like in tennis, you're much more likely to go in the net when you're tight, whereas in touch tennis, you're much more likely to go long when you're tight because you pop it instead of ripping it. And in tennis, you just go oh, like that and you sort of decelerate and the ball goes in the net, whereas in touch tennis, you don't accelerate enough and it goes long. Would you agree with that? Yeah, I think the nice thing, it's all about the ball in touch tennis. The nice thing about it is you can't get away with pushing. The ball will float. Yeah. The ball will go long. Yeah. Um, so when you get tight in touch tennis, you cannot afford to open the strings up. You know, what, what people, people tend to do when they play tennis, you know, at a certain level is they'll push the ball quite flat, you know, nudge it into play. But as soon as you do that in the touch tennis court, the ball floats. So yeah. it really encourages you to, to hit through your shots, even under pressure. And I think, you know, that can that can help to transform your mentality on the tennis court too. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I've seen a lot of people do that when they've, they've been in unbelievable winning positions um, and they've just tightened up like a clam, just shut. And you see them sort of, I want to win this because they haven't beaten this player, you know, he or she, you know, has got their number and they just start pushing the ball like that. And... The other player is just back against the wall, doesn't care, and is still free hitting. And I've seen people implode mentally 
it's and it's incredible because the physical manifestation is only a reflection of what's going on in their mind they're tight they're pretty much you can see them like <laughs> choking it up and gagging everything long um and a great example of that is Arian Furuhande. I mean, I don't know if those of you who remember, you know, he was playing a doubles match, very important match, and got tight, jumped up, and gagged a smash. I mean, I, I'd, I'd hate to bring it up today. I'm going to afford him the courtesy of not playing that video. But uh, unless, of course, Ash, do you not remember the video? Do you think you need to see it? Uh, yeah, I don't recall it, actually. I don't, would you mind getting it up? <laughs> <laughs> the video, yeah? I should know better. You should know better, right? So, for those of you that doesn't don't um, that don't uh, have never seen this video, if you're one of the half a million people that have been on Mars um, over the last couple of months and haven't seen this video, this is what happens when you get tight on an overhead. We, we call it affectionately the monkey jump. Um, yeah, I'm sorry, Alan. I'm, I need to play it more often. I hope you got a chance to see it there. We affectionately call it the monkey jump where he just is just so tight now because he feels like he should have won this point 95 times over. He's, there's no way he should. And so he's just getting tighter and tighter. And then he, he gets one here and he just does the monkey jump. And then he's still falling and spanks it wide. Um, and that's a classic example. Yeah, it's just of getting tight in a point, let alone in a match situation. And Al Mazzetti provided the entertainment there by just, just hoisting the ball up and up and up. Just dirty, dirty lobbing. Love it. Love it. Yeah, the, the length of that rally in itself just increased the pressure. At each shot, that ball came back. The pressure was mounting, wasn't it? And it had to end up with that with that smash. It's brilliant. Yeah, and that's, and that's so valid. You know, people don't realise that the longer a point goes on, the pressure that mounts that you do not want to miss. I mean, I play Al probably like, you know, once. I remember when we first moved into the bar, we played every single day, like full, without fail, every single day. And then our bodies were just breaking down after a year and we're like, okay, we need to cut it down. So we cut it down to every other day. No, four times out of five. Um, but I remember whenever we get into rallies, there's a lot of pride between us about like who's got, the steadier backhand, for example, or who's not going to miss on an exchange. So if I'm going forehand line to his backhand, he's just making backhands. Make, and he, for him to miss, he hates it. He considers himself like um, a Beresategi, you know, one of those junk ballers who refuses to miss. And he's just, eh, eh, he's just rolling it up the line. And he knows the pressure is just building on my forehand, which is my most least consistent shot. Or even if it's backhand to backhand, I'm just there going, just trying to get that ball across court. And once you get past about 10 shots, I don't care who you are, you start going, I don't want to miss. But you're also, your, your opponent is giving you the ball that you could just unload on up the line, but you don't want to take it on. It's so similar when, when I look at club club doubles and you see that player at the net and there's a big cross court rally happening and you can see them just going into a shell, you know, dreading that time where the ball's going to go down the line. So the yeah. best thing you can do is try and get involved in the point as early as possible. You know, make that interception on on the return or on the, on the next ball. But you know, as that as that rally lengthens, there's so much pressure on on that net player, and at some point it's going to go there. So um, no, it's funny what the mind can do and, and how you can feel when you're when you're playing in those long long rallies. So I'm going to let you go now. And uh, last question for you. So get a little tip for your club players out there who are it's lockdown for across the country. So a lot of people are going to be playing against someone from their family so the chances are they're going to have to be playing against an absolute bunny or somebody they can routine there's very few families where you've got siblings that are of equal ability what can they do to improve their game during lockdown um to make themselves a better player for when it when they come back to playing against much better players again be that tennis or touch tennis this is a bit out there this is a bit out um outside of the box but coach them and learn how to coach them and if you are i've become a much better player since being 
a coach because I've researched the game. You know, I, I know, you know, all of the tactical intentions that you need to know. I know, you know, everything that you learn as a coach really helps you as a player. So if you can do a bit of research, head out on, on YouTube, you know, look into different coaching tips for coaching various levels of player. And if you can help to develop their game, then it's actually going to help to develop your game in turn. You know, quite often when you are playing with a, a family member who doesn't play tennis, it's, it's very, very tough to get anything out of it physically. But if you if you get more out of it mentally um, with knowledge, you know, improving your tennis knowledge, understanding different things about the techniques and different things about tactics, you can actually take them into your game when you return to the tennis court and practice yourself. But outside of that, improve your fitness as much as you can. Um, yeah, fitness and knowledge, really, as, as far as, as you can go um, when you can't get on tennis court playing with, with like-minded people. Wonderful. It's been an absolute pleasure having you on. For those of you that aren't following, um, it is The Tennis Mentor. His name is tagged at the bottom there. So it's at the underscore tennis underscore mentor. He is former coach of the year award winner from, um, from the LTA both locally regionally and then nationally and is an all-round wonderful guy former top 10 touch tennis player and has some great video content Ash I really want to thank you for your evening giving up your time to be on the touch tennis show tonight and I'm so grateful that you were the first ever touch tennis live guest that we've had on the show thank you so much much Rash it's been incredible and um you know I wish you all the luck with with you know getting these next live shows out. I'm sure you have lots of good guests and um, yeah, awesome stuff. Thanks for having me. Been an absolute pleasure. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, that was Ashley Neves and I have had the absolute pleasure of having him on the show tonight. And as you always, having you on the show tonight as well, watching, answers, asking questions uh, and engaging with us as part of our tribe. I really hope all of you have had a wonderful weekend, a great Christmas break. We'll be back tomorrow night where we are announcing the winner of the Touch Tennis Home Kit. Um, but for now, from Ashley Neves and from myself, stay happy, stay healthy, and most of all, if you want to be the GOAT, stay humble. Good night.